Vice Strauss, Chair of the Graduate Program in Art Criticism and Writing here at the School of Visual Arts. This is our sec the, uh, the second in our fall series of lectures. On Tuesday, November 17th, we'll have Eleanor Hartney speak on Art Today, Tales of Plastic Surgery, Genetically Altered Rabbits, and Other Acts of Art. On Saturday, November 14th, Jonathan Crary will give the keynote speech for the Media Modes Graduate Student Conference at 4 p.m., followed by a book signing and reception uh, across the hall there. <coughs> um, I've been asked to uh, say that there, asked that there not be um, uh, audio or video recording. We're, we are recording the lectures and they'll be online uh, very quickly. Like a lot of other people, um, I owe part of my education to Sylvain Latrinier at, and Jim Fleming at Semiotext, who brought continental theory uh, to the masses, or at least to artists and writers. One of the signal treats of this project has been Sylvain's ongoing dialogue with Paul Virilio, who Sylvain has called undoubtedly the most important thinker of technology since Martin Heidegger. These conversations began in 1983 with Pure War and continued with Crepuscular Dawn in 2002 and the Accident of Art in 2005. Silvera has also edited the collected interviews of William Burroughs, the collected interviews of Michel Foucault, Hatred of Capitalism, a semi-text reader with Chris Krauss, and French Theory in America with Sandy Cohen in 2001. His most recent books are David Wanarovich, A D Definitive History of Five or Six Years on the Lower East Side, and Overexposed, Perverting, per uh, perverting Perversion. Silvera is just now uh, retiring as professor of French and comparative literature at Columbia and is the Jean Baudrillard Professor of the European Graduate School. Please welcome Sylvain Lautringer. So, bonjour. Uh, we're going to speak English today, but we'll have uh, some sort of dialogue between the French and the English in the film, because the film is in French, and but it is subtitled, and it was uh, shot about a year ago um, uh, in La Rochelle. No, actually, in a school of architecture where um, Virilio used to be um, first uh, head and then the president of the Archi school of architecture in Paris. Now he's retired and he's in La Rochelle. And um, one of the characteristics of uh, Paul Virilio is that uh, this uh, prophet of speed and movement never moves uh, and never travels. So uh, in despair, uh, I went there and with a video camera and I videotaped myself a conversation that we had. Um, it, it is uh, my first video and uh, the cameraman wasn't at the rendezvous, so uh, I'll show it to you, but this is, a, so let's say, experimental. Um, but I think quite interesting. It was done also uh, right before the right before the the financial crisis, and we're talking about that, and then follow up uh, after that. Um, what I'd like to do is um, give you a, some sort of general introduction to the introduction to another another two years of uh, work. What I'd like to do is uh, the last about last about two minutes, give you minutes, and some, and then you can pick sort of can pick up thread dark threads what was that was said. You can you can pick external thread. Meteorists and scientists and this 
interested in the uh, the uh, judge, the tangeria, the tangeria, but that uh, but that he was very much, very much fist, fist, and passion, passion, the uh, post to post to. That the conversation conversation immediately immediately is that uh, that uh, the one there, the one there, that uh, that uh, the one very, the one very well, and what worth, what worth. Uh, uh, wing, wing, and and uh, for to, for to, um, to, um, together to, together for pure for pure was one of, was one of the first book, first book published published uh, in the uh, it was it was a discussion discussion what 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 was in that we in that we book book um, uh, um, uh, new of the next of this of that but but we book first book by two to by two all where all where for. Uh, for the month and some, month and some, it was it was a way of a way of resorting to resorting to G <laughs> G and I thought and I thought like uh, like uh, interesting to interesting on the on the theory make theory make everything but everything but cover cover uh, uh, will uh, will come that to some that to really sort of really also also one of the one of the main main thinkers thinkers uh, we introduced uh, we introduced the time the time the other the other but the third one the third one was Guattari so Guattari the, we could the, we could talk about talk about the passing Passive of putting of putting the Deleuze the Deleuze and Virilia and Virilia. It's it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Uh, uh, I managed my to manage my but not every not every could it could it. Virilia was Virilia was friend of the friend of the and 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 Baudrillard uh, Baudrillard and uh, and uh, Baudrillard Baudrillard communicate communicate. I managed I managed to show to show them bring that bring that on to on to anyone anyone like that like that you know have a, you know have a if it's if it's be on tier on tier the the or tier or tier thing for more. For more different, 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 confronted with, confronted with, basically, basically, the emerging, the emerging. That's uh, that's uh, what we know, what we know about today, about today. Uh, so, uh, so let me, let me. So, 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 we will use, we will use, um, um, suffer by, suffer by. Actually, actually, very, very, the French, the French, the way, the way, regular, regular mix, mix, uh, the, uh, the, it, it, uh, the, 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 well, well, means that it means that it means so bad, so bad. Have the right, have the right. They, they, in the crack, in the crack, in the universe, in the universe, they, 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 the universe, the universe has a happy, has a happy, you, you, and that ex, and that explain, explain the, the seventy, seventy, the take just take just on itself, on itself, the, uh, you know. You know, really, uh, really, uh, treat of, uh, treat of, uh, treat of the, treat of the theorists, theorists, where they were, where they were very probably, very probably this country, and I could also go more into this uh, uh, history of theory, both in the state and outside, and the position that Virilio occupies. Uh, Virilio and Baudrillard were the last one that I uh, introduced in semi text, and they share a lot together, although they are very different in many ways. But they are what I would call the, the two extrapolationists. Um, and um, some of the extremities that they take uh, may shock a bit at the times, but uh, that's the way they do their research. So Paul Filio is not a philosopher by training, but an architect and especially an urban planner. In France, to be an architect, you have to have a training as a, as a scientist or a physician, and Filio uh, does have uh, some training in that respect. So they return to philosophy in order to investigate the nature of the threat technology presents to the city, to the police, and by extension to politics and democracy. What Virilio was the first to realize is that uh, the violence exerted by technology had to do with speed, a factor that had been consistently disregarded in favor of economy. Now let's uh, wait for a second on notion of speed. Uh, Virilio doesn't talk about speed as speed. This he talks about the effect of speed on the, on the environment. So that's really what he means. Speed is not just to go from here to there, but whether you walk from one point A A to B, or, B, or you go by by train, or, you know, by car, or, or by plane. The, the the type of uh, sort of reality that uh, you uh, you cross this is not the same. So there is a distortion that comes with speed, and this distortion is linked to uh, some sort of kinetic uh, element that uh, uh, that 
that sort of implies the, the kind of violence you 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 create on perception. So, so basically, what uh, Virgilio uh, when Virgilio talks about speed, he talks about sort of the impact of speed on the environment or on something, and not uh, sort of speed as uh, a way of going faster. Uh, so most southern farmers, the speed and the war at the root of uh, the urban development. From the first the city bastard divisions resist resisting sea footage warfare with weapons obstruct vision, so that's why you call to the tackle period, to the world of movement involved during winds of destruction, that's what you could call a strategic period, to uh, total wars, leveling down cities with weapons of communication, so the, mm, to, uh, logistic period, but the violence and war are sort of always closely woven in the fabric of progress. So sort of what will progress? And like the most contemporary philosophers, sort of, the sort of, is much less interested in the history philosophy than sort of, the philosophy of history. But of the sort of, kind of, that owes a little to sort of, Marxism. Sort of, and in that respect, he's uh, the only one sort of, of all the sort of, deep French is not sort of, to have been touched by sort of, the Marxism at all. Sort of, he can't sort of, to another place. Deeps, uh, sort of, in your world, sort of, I, uh, I realized that he worked to work from a place of that way far sort of, from my damage to the sure that was a uh, and with uh, the culture dedicated to sort of, his version to, to, to Catholicism uh, and uh, as an adolescent gift and, and sort of the position to occupy to rise in, in, in his philosophy. But uh, uh, my own issue sort of relation to that is that, uh, that uh, 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 he need an active career somewhere uh, sort of, in order to feel also to the fire uh, and encourages uh, to good me. And as you sort of uh, bring out to that, uh, uh, some perspective, uh, sort of on the world, sort of 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 the all the other tell first came from teammates and they all include, including they all include the old 1668 as big as I've teammates I've met the uh in the Nabser Tanser TA has big TA to a beauty team made beauty for you and you and Fred uh uh in a T in a concept and consequent to the beauty to main time has big time we had in theory and theory relation teamation of group group people people who the men did that did that to uh see to uh the entire Italian Tyson the beauty that will put us be post me to you and to and he men but uh but very Nietzsche the Nietzsche the men are uh so radio see radio of very stuff very special abusion or the other as be other theory and theories team so so pin in the pin in part of first first book raise the tea raise the quote dramat dramol the beauty Ramos has been most experienced speed. Was in the wake in the wake of the eight the eight to name the to name the gem the gemonism theism rooted tattered of thinking of thinking has been summarized and summarized situation situations coming that's coming in from in from the the sixty sixty the 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 first revolution has revolution possible and possible teams though though to the to devil the it was not it was not revolution revolution winning at winning at was over the gap and the government but it but it was some sort of some sort of motion in the motion in the many many all because it all because of the type of ideology ideology has been it happened it happened and is that time is that the the tradition the tradition rhetorical historical communist communist the the trade has been trade you in move, in move, go, go, head with head with uh, together, the together with movement, movement. So, so uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was of a year of a play apps, play apps, a beautiful, beautiful world that they had, that they had. The we're not, the we're not going to be going to be action, action. And the uh, the left has left had look for look for the or the or the then or the or the struggle, the struggle. Hence, hence the decline, the decline, ism, ism. You know, you know, the party, the party, on the team. The idea, the idea, the idea, the idea. Uh, they had uh, they had turned turned to capitalism capitalism in order to in order to right capital right capital they were they were examined examined capitalism capitalism uh, and the uh, and 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 try to try to act from just from capitalism the capitalism the e that it e that is to sub to sub it's like it's like the uh, with the end with the end and try and try and make sure, make sure you're not you're not compromised compromised but 
So this uh, this uh, mission was mission was not exactly not exactly call and the call and a lot of the lot of the that uh, that uh, just this just this not exactly not exactly the right the right because it's because it's uh, uh, much a bear much a bear with uh, with uh, the Frank the Frank um, um, called the called the country new country new uh, uh, the years the years have years and have years and have to be paid to be paid. The history, the history, and every, and every light of the light of Rundi, Rundi, very, very credit, key credit, law and regular and regular of movement of movement. Similar, similar, in a circle, a circle, and sin, and this, this state, state, or class, or class, a, a main, a main fact of transformation. Every power, according to him, is democratic because it must rely on transport and transmission to control its territory. From the time of the empires, uh, you had to send messages. You had to certain uh, uh, cast of scribe to which uh, some power was scribe, etc. So, uh, transport, transmission, the speed of transmission uh, was very important. And uh, of course, Virgil never discovered speed. It existed from the very beginning, from uh, from people who were racing to horses, etc., etc. But it is the impact of speed on society that he is actually uh, one of the first to, dis to, to bring out. In ancient Greece, relative speed worked for democracy, but the speed of modern technologies drastically changed the nature of power. Speed started working against space, turning geopolitics into chronopolitics, bringing about in a process, as he, as he would say, the defeat of the defeat of, of the world as a field, as a distance, as a matter. The killing fields of World War I prove, proved that only advances in military transportation were capable of bring, bring, breaking the stalemate of trench warfare. In other words, the first World War, in the First World War, the two armies were buried in trenches. And there was no way of uh, breaking uh, this kind of um, lock unless they started inventing technological weapons that could do that. The first one was a tank, was uh, an interesting uh, construction for an architect, architect since it was a house that, that her house on wheels. And a house that was both defensive and offensive, a house that uh, could uh, bring protection to the soldiers, but at the same time kill soldiers. So the, the, the invention of the tanks were what allowed to, uh, to, to move on top, beyond, over the trenches and uh, bring some sort of reso resolution to a war of extermination that may not have ended otherwise. The second one, the second element, which was only a beginning at the time, was of course aviation. And uh, that was also uh, uh, if you read recently uh, the manifestos of the Italian futurist, whose anniversary it was, you could remember Marinetti uh, proclaiming, you know, this kind of you know, uh, uh, euphoria of uh, flying over the roof, uh, barely over the roof of uh, of uh, Rome, you know, uh, with the sense of being like Icarus, having this kind of total power. And you know, of course, and Virilio wrote uh, his last book on uh, futurism, and uh, basically from futurism to the to the to the financial crisis, uh, the the apology of uh, the apology of technology, but the futurists are leading not only to uh, to fascism as it uh, they did, but also to a certain uh, um, certain vision of the progress that they had but that uh, turned, it seems, into some sort of a nightmare. So, um, the emergence of a war economy, or the, what happened then is that during the First World War, uh, people started realizing by building tanks and by developing uh, 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 weapons uh, like uh, like. Uh, planes, but also by uh, experimenting with uh, with um, a poison gas. That's another book that uh, Slaughter Dick uh, has published, Terror from the Air. Terror from the Air was uh, mean that 
for the first time we began to have a total war in the sense that it was not just uh, individual soldiers that you were killing through gas, but it was like masses of soldiers, and also basically uh, you were extending war to the population. Uh, and uh, Slaughter Dick in that book that we published recently shows that this is the same gas that was used in extermination camp during the Second World War. And uh, the outcome of that is that war used to be uh, limited to the battlefields, and from the First World War, uh, it started becoming a, a, a war, a total war, a war to the population themselves, a war of total destruction. And that's what Virilio is coming from, uh, since he was uh, in, a, in, in a city that was destroyed, and that was supposed what has haunted him uh, all the time. Uh, now, uh, what I was uh, saying is that this... Uh, uh, the st when the stalemate, the stalemate was only uh, broken, broken because uh, people realized that technology has to uh, be uh, to uh, that in order in order to win the next war, you had to prepare for the next war. In other words, you have to have a, a logistic. It's not only that each army has to be accompanied by uh, by uh, by food and and, uh, and bullets and all that but you had to get ready to the next war by uh, developing technology. And that's exactly what, uh, uh, what uh, Virgil is talking about. Uh, from the First World War, the development of technology uh, brought about by, uh, by war and by the prospect of war erased the boundaries between peace and war. Logistics made it such that war was not something that was declared at a certain time, not an interruption and uh, uh, that, that would eventually bring a conclusion. But the entire society uh, was working, in a way, to, uh, to, to prepare for the next war. Uh, the entire society has, be has become logistic. So uh, this uh, emergence of a war economy inaugurated the, what he calls the logistical revolution from a logist to competitor, a, a logic of competition. The technology was uh, being developed, uh, not because there was a war in sight, but because there was a possibility of a, of a war and because there was a preparation of the war. Um, in, um, very often, uh, very few quotes Eisenhower, uh, Eisenhower's word, uh, which said that the nation's potential was transferred to its armed forces, whether in times of peace or in times of war. This logistical gap prefigured uh, the post-World War II military-industrial complex in which the preparation for war became war itself. Its logical outcome was a Cold War with the scientific surprise of the atomic bomb. A new balance of terror was established, a nuclear deterrence. Each of the two rival blocs bent on depleting its own population in order to achieve technological dominance. That was uh, endocolonization, another phenomenon that uh, Virilio analyzed uh, uh, in relation to uh, South America. Uh, everyone thought that what, what was happening in South America was uh, some sort of a backward uh, imposition of, uh, by the military uh, of a certain order on the population. But uh, Virilio, from the time of pure war, had already realized that uh, South America had become the, the laboratory uh, for, uh, for a mechanism that would be applied to, uh, to uh, more developed uh, societies. And uh, the end of colonization of, in our societies was achieved not uh, through a dictatorship, but uh, through deregulation of the civil society and the end of the welfare state. Right? In other words, uh, Reaganism, uh, Thatcherism, neoliberalism, uh, that was one way we uh, managed to, uh, to uh, boost up the military uh, build-up uh, at the expense of the population. We're seeing that right now, uh, even with the best possible intention on top. Every technical innovation now directly or indirectly contributes to war and has to abide uh, by the flow chart, chart monitoring the logistic potential of the nation. In other words, everything has to be planned in advance. This fusion of science and war signaled the breakdown of the distinction between the military and the domestic. 
making it impossible to identify the enemy. If you want to think for two minutes, uh, um, uh, there is a book by Deleuze Guattari called The Nomadology, The War Machine, and um, I, I talked to very you about it because I wanted to know exactly what he thought about it, and he said, I can't understand it. And for a good reason, for Virilio, uh, uh, pure war is not a war that, uh, that is waged by the army or by the military, but it is, in a sense, a war that is being waged against society itself, by society itself. It took me a while. I, 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 was, I kept looking for the enemy, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> but the enemy is us. Uh, the enemy is uh, the society that we have created. Uh, this is very different from Deleuze and Guattari, who are trying on the contrary, and that's, that's significant of the differences that they may have, difference with approach. They were trying to differentiate uh, the army from the state, and showing that the state, like Coriolanus or Patton, General Patton, uh, the army always has a, comes from somewhere and has a tendency uh, and, and is being uh, hired by the state, but that there is always a tension between the army and the state. Uh, for Virilio, the, there is no difference between the two, and he kept repeating, I'm not an enemy of the military. Uh, it is, you know, what uh, technology is doing, and the fact that, of course, most of the technology, if not all the technology, is being uh, designed and produced uh, for military purposes, and eventually uh, 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 filters down to the population, as, as the case with the internet and uh, with the web and all that, though we can talk about it later. So, um, it's impossible to identify the enemy, and uh, we'll see that's a bit of a problem, and, you know, if everyone is the enemy, uh, then you have, we are virtually in some sort of um, a paranoid situation, right? And that's, of course, uh, uh, where uh, Virilio could be put if we were to have to assign anything any sort of st stigma to it. Um, the situation is to where uh, written that, in that uh, we're the first to be uh, put in that situation and reacted in their own way to it. Uh, for them, the war was uh, the war that consumerism, the invasion of uh, France, uh, of uh, Europe by consumerism, and the fact that everyone was being turned into an enemy because anyone, like uh, the invasion of the body snatchers, it was invasion of the images, the sign themselves, that was snatching people and turning them into consumers. So that was a kind of paranoid situation too, to which they reacted, uh, let's say, creatively, by uh, trying to maintain the possibility of a resistance, right? an organized resistance. The uh, resistance for them was uh, through various distortion, uh, drifting, uh, 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 experiment uh, with uh, with uh, with the images uh, reappropriation that were allowed a certain and of course group experiment that allowed them to remain alive in a world that had succumbed to uh, to the the exchangeability of science. Uh, this kind of magnetism, of course, can dangerously veer towards uh, delirium, and yet uh, it provides an extreme in an extreme form, truth that otherwise would remain unavailable. Don't forget that for Deleuze and Guattari, uh, delirium and capitalism are just one and the same thing. Capitalism is not, has nothing rational about it uh, any more than the stock exchange is rational, except when they go to the cash register. Um, Virilio's indictment of the new technologies could be read as a powerful rewriting of Guy Debord's vision, the confusion between civilians and the military, crystallizing the passage from total war to pure war, a war uh, ultimately waged not between two specific adversaries, but between technology and humanity. Uh, pure war no longer needs men, that was in, pure war, in the book called Pure War, Pure war no longer needs men, and that's why it is pure. It doesn't need the human war machine mobilize human forces. So that's also a characteristic of both Baudrillard and Virilio, because both of them are the only one to, uh, to leave no space for any sort of a human agency. And that's why they've been resisted also by, by all the other theorists and, and, and people who uh, tried to intervene in some way 
in both cases, uh, there is no place for subjectivity or direct form of resistance, although there are strategies that are being devised. But they are not, uh, they're not individual strategies, and often they are not even collective strategies. Um, myths have a capacity to mobilize. And pure war, like a total war, is a myth which clearly echoes Ernest Junger's call for total mobilization. Uh, if we have time, we can talk about Junger, because he was a very important figure, uh, not only for Virilio, but in the discovery both of logistics and of the total mobilization, which uh, doesn't mean mobilization of the army or of uh, people to the army, but mobilization where they are. In other words, the readiness for mobilization is what he's talking about. Myths also have an analytical capacity bringing out destructive tendencies still latent in technology. They turn them into an object of reflection. More than any other thinkers today, Virilio helped dispel the humanistic discourse on technology, which usually casts it in instrumental and anthropological terms as if technology was a mere applied science. And uh, Verilio makes a huge difference between science, he's not opposed to science, but he's opposed to the instrument that are being extracted from science. Um, manufacturing objects meant to enhance human life. Um, there's an ambivalence, of course, because these are the same that cure us and the, one, and the same that kill us. Uh, and both of them belong to the same uh, uh, instrumentalization of uh, science. Um, Heidegger reminded us that the essence of a techné doesn't reside in the making itself, rather in the fulfillment of an underlying project or scheme. Although Virilio rarely refers to Heidegger, uh, he considers as well technology not in neutral term, but as a sort of combat that draws up and develops uh, unsaid, the unsaid and the unknown. Though uh, he, uh, he rarely addresses directly Heidegger's questioning of technology, Virilio powerfully contributed to refocus the debate, the debate on what it means for technology to, uh, to gestel, gestel or arraign or order the real. For Virilio, technology is an enigma. And that's why he was talking about the unsaid, the unthought. Technology is not where, well, what he tried to, uh, to, to constantly bring out is the fact that what seems to us uh, in the order of uh, you know, natural, uh, evident, obvious, etc., is in fact a puzzle that we have to solve in order to understand what it entails. Same way, speed is not just going fast, speed is the is a transformation, a transfiguration that occurs when we uh, use it and we use by it. Um, so te technology is an enigma that can only be addressed properly by bring it, bringing, out, bringing out its negative sides, which until now have been systematically ignored or considered extrinsic to the invention. Accident were not supposed to tell us anything about the nature of a car or of an atomic plant because they were thought to be contingent. And yet, inventions produce and even program specific accidents, which are as much a creation of the machine uh, as the machine itself. Accidents reveal the essence of the machine. They are interruptions, and all interruptions are formative of consciousness. There's another book called uh, the, the, the aesthetics of disappearance. And the aesthetics of disappearance, uh, uh, it suggests that uh, interruption is what allows consciousness because it gives a distance, because uh, otherwise it would uh, be caught in the flux, as when we are in front of television. We have such a hard time extracting ourselves from the screen because there is no interruption. We have a series of, you know, molecules that, uh, that, that circulate as opposed to a film when you have like a, an interruption that is overcome each time, but there is, each image is distinct, remains distinct. So uh, the problem is that to, when you're plugged into the television, as you, it's as if you were plugged into the wall, 
In other words, you go through a titanic reaction and uh, you, go, you, you are permeated by the kinetic energy of the television or whatever uh, uh, machine you, uh, you are connected to and uh, there is no way of extracting it yourself. You wake up three hours later having wasted your time <laughs> in front of a television because there is no reason to stop it and no power of stopping it. it, it, it uh, there is no interruption. And, and uh, it could be said that uh, the interruption also, there is interruption between work and uh, work and, and pleasure or, work, or what is work and what is not. And what we are attending now, and we have been for the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, is the disappearance of all the boundaries, including the boundaries between life and work. And so that now uh, people work constantly and people can't work even when they don't think they work. And as people uh, come to this country, uh, realize pretty fast, they came to have to do some work and, and to live, and they realize that life and work is just one and the same thing. There is no possibility of interrupting. Hence, no possibility of thinking the kind of life that we're leading or the kind of technology that we're using. So the idea of interruption is very important. For Velio, it's like uh, the idea that if we, were, uh, we don't realize that we are winking when we watch, when we look, but if we, were, if we stop winking, then we would be like totally uh, uh, hallucinating. We would be uh, in some sort of trance. And that's exactly what technology provides. And more and more, since technology is now going from uh, discrete uh, images to a, a flow of continuous images, there is no winking anymore and no time to reflect upon it. And Velio puts a lot of emphasis on reflection and knowledge, I guess because there is nothing else that he can do about technology, right? But we can talk about that later. So. Uh, one of the reasons uh, Veglio brings out the negative side is not, uh, he protests about it, is not that he's negative or pessimistic, and it's the same uh, accusation that is uh, born on Baudrillard uh, himself. They both accuse of being pessimistic. But if you extrapolate, uh, you extrapolate not to, to reassure everyone, you extrapolate in order to see what is in the culture that could be destructive. And what we owe of Veglio is to have uh, bravely emphasized all these dark aspects and destructive aspects of our culture. And if we want to look for something more rosy, uh, probably we should go to, uh, to Deleuze and to, Fou to Foucault, maybe a bit less, <laughs> but at least to Deleuze and Guattari. And it doesn't mean that one is exclusive of the other. It means that there are different, uh, different uh, uh, um, um, glasses, you know. His theory offers us glasses, and in glasses also like speed distorts. So you see more one uh, kind of system bringing out, or one vision of the world coming out than the other. But it doesn't mean that one excludes the other. I, I would say that sometimes they, they, they combat each other, and but no one is sure at this point who is going to win and if there was going to be a winner. And that's one of the reasons I say these theories may be opposed at time and, and uh, incompatible to each other. And uh, I mentioned that because two days ago I was, uh, I was at a panel in, uh, in New York where, where the, uh, the, the writer, Edouard Glissant, is uh, obviously a, a Nietzschean, uh, not a Nietzschean, a Deleuzean. And it seems to be incompatible to have a vision of plurality and, and multiplicity and fluidity and singularity and uh, the kind of perspective that Virilio is, uh, is offering us. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't have to choose. You see, uh, we are both, uh, and it depends also the position we take. Edouard Glissant, for instance, come from, uh, come from Martinique, uh, and uh, he has a vision of the world that, uh, is, uh, that derived from the, the, the Caribbeans, uh, where creolism and creolization and, and, uh, and mosaics uh, seem to have a chance to uh, counter this kind of uh, unified, uh, unitary vision that uh, both uh, Baudrillard and Virilio develop. But I would say each one its own job. See, Virilio does, he, that does his own, and uh, I don't think he could be called pessimistic for that, although uh, uh, at times I wish uh, what is uh, in the offing looked a little brighter than it does, right? But only God knows. Hmm? Okay. 
Um, so accidents were not supposed to tell us anything about the nature of the car or the atomic plant because they were thought to be contingent. Right? Accidents reveal the essence of the machine. They are interruptions and all interruptions are formative of consciousness. They give access to a certain knowledge. They provide a certain political understanding about the thing. Recasting Aristotelian philosophy in this new pers perspective, Velio reversed the traditional relation between substance and accident, making the accident far more substantial, even in invention in its own right. And this led him to advocate creating a museum of accidents. And he did that in Cartier in uh, 2002. And if we have time, I can tell you more about that. Um, the Museum of Accident uh, was supposed to be, uh, to be uh, created in La Villette, and there is something of the sort, but not exactly what VLU expected. Uh, in fact, uh, the tendency is rather to exhibit uh, what is a triumph of civilization and not what its, uh, its, uh, its failures. And uh, he had a hard time to impose the idea that there should be something that uh, the accident being as predictable, well, not when they happen, but as programmed as they are, they should occupy the same space as the construction that uh, testify to the, to the creative, uh, uh, creativity of a culture. The accident is a creation, it is an invention, it shouldn't be looked at as negatively. It is something that has to be exhibited in order to be reflected upon. Accidents are all the more necessary that they permit to unravel the riddle of technology, whose substance always proves to be destructive. However positive its contribution to civilization may claim to be. Every machine is a war machine, as exemplified by the Italian futurist infatuation with technology and fascism, unless they are Explicitly, explicitly conceived to break down and self-destruct, as uh, happened to the Dada machines or Tingeli's contraptions. Uh, both the futurist and the Dada were, were, uh, were doing work at the same time, but the difference between the two could be very enlightening. You know? the, Dada's, the Dada as a group was also broken down. It was a machine that didn't work and worked creatively because it didn't work. Uh, people were dispersed, People were different from different countries. So people constantly were, you know, uh, uh, parodying uh, the bourgeoisie, parodying what they were dealing with. The futurists were extremely uh, 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 serious and uh, exalted about what they were doing, but also were, were making a tight group with a, a leader such as De Boer would be later or, or Breton would be later. Uh, there is not such a thing as one avant-garde. There is various avant-gardes, and uh, uh, the disappearance of the avant-garde could give the possibility of having another kind of avant-garde, the avant-garde that is not ahead of the others, but it is uh, working together, and that's what I think, in some ways, art is becoming right now. Not an avant-garde, but a, a mass guard for capitalism. Uh, <clears throat> so... Um, Clausewitz, Clausewitz recognized the tendency for a war to go to the extremes beyond any control, politics being the only way to prevent complete release of the violence. Vieillot realized that well that, as well that only by going to extremes and extrapolating the destructive bent inherent to modern technology would theory be able to assess the exact nature of the threat. But theory itself need an interruption of its own. And Virilio's own writing is made of interruptions. He's a, he, he writes in staircases. As he said, when I begin with a sentence, uh, I work it out, I work out an idea, and when I consider it suggested enough, then he just drops it and, and moves to another stage. It is a some sort of strange uh, echo to, uh, to uh, Nietzsche's aphorisms. Um, Deliberately adopting what he called the politics of the very worst, uh, he allowed him, allowed him to simulate in advance, in theoretical terms, the race in which humanity, still unaware, is engaging his own disappearance. In other words, uh, Virilio's theory 
is some sort of laboratory for something that may happen the same way endocolonization happened somewhere and was transported somewhere else. It's presenting not uh, something final, but uh, a work in progress. And I think uh, the whole the progress accomplished by society is there to reinforce it every day. I, I, I never open a newspaper without reading Virilio these days. Uh, readily identif identify readily and identifiable in dynamic vehicles, the effect of technological violence are no less powerful for remaining unnoticed. In fact, the least explicit the violence, it seems, the more far-reaching its impact. Moving from vehicular vectors, outwardly military in, natures, in nature, tanks, etc., to more intangible weapons of communication, visual technology like photography, film, television, and video, up to the most recent advances in electronic media technologies, all indirect offshoots of military research and Star Wars type of technological deterrence. Verilio went on to suggest in the early 90s that this technology approaching the absolute value of the speed of light is now waging another kind of war on the human environment. The real time of telecommunication is abolishing the distinction between the real and pictures that we derive from it, substituting to the actual physical proximity a more virtual kind of presence. This transparency, or as he called trans-appearance, um, emphasizing the spectral aspects of the phenomenon is the ultimate accident generated by the vision machines, the title of one of his books. Instantaneity and ubiquity are now cancelling memory and history, triggering a generalized derealization of reality. The, instant, the advent of instant time on a global scale announces the virtual disappearance of the social. Modern technology has drastically changed our relation uh, to the world, which can only be grasped in Heidegger's formula as a word picture. Upping the ante on technology, Virgil realized that beyond a certain threshold, tendencies suddenly reverse their course and reveal themselves for what they are. Actually, catastrophe means that, a reversal. So there is some sort of catastrophe of theory when theory itself reverse, reverses its, its phenomenon. As open conflict turned into armed peace, expansion into endocolonization, and invention into accident, going to the extremes similarly turned movement into sedentariness, polar inertia. Those who read Pure World remember Howard Hughes and how Howard Hughes who own cinema, aviation, etc., end up like a, like a, a recluse, a technological recluse uh, with the same uh, room in, a, in, in penthouses all over the world watching the same film. Uh, when you go very fast on a car, uh, you have a sense of total euphoria or you, you have a sense that you are still. Uh, that's what uh, could be called polar inertia. Polar inertia is when, th when speed goes too much for, in order to, uh, to be able uh, to have a conscious of it, of it. Of course, if you crash the car at 200 miles an hour, you realize suddenly that your euphoria was uh, what the euphoria was about, otherwise you wouldn't have any idea. Um, like a disabled body saddled with micro-machines, the able-bodied person now super-equipped with high-tech electronic processes couldn't move anymore. The speed of images was replacing actual physical movement. Everything now, as he said, now arrived without ever having to depart. That's the instantaneity the instant feedback. With telepresence and instant telecommunication, instant telecommunications, the confusion between dynamic and static vehicles has been resolved in favor of the vision machine. As really very you wrote, at present, the only true performing vehicle is the image. Thank you. So I'm going to show the image since what we are talking about. Okay.
One thing you spoke about with technology is it increases speed. And it seemed to be in the sense we thought of technology in a more traditional sense. Um, uh, the inventions of science, they're more uh, tangible results. And I actually started thinking a lot about um, the technology of semiotics and how it's also increased in the speed, I mean, very much fueled by technological progress where um, we all have the internet now and computers and access to media at a much quicker rate, much more quickly. And um, that almost these symbols or signifiers, these semio technologies, have grown to be of a huge capacity, an almost frightening capacity, where one quick snapshot that we all have as a shared point of reference can carry so, so, so much meaning, so much more than before a single word could. And what is the danger if that speed of communication and that speed of, of symbolism when we are being inculcated almost, not inculcated, I don't want to, I don't want to bind this idea that like we're all being exploited by consumerist politics or something, but um, I think what, there's great um, possibility for progress, but also a frightening, a frightening ability to not see how much we're communicating when our signifiers, when our semiotic technology becomes so quick and so fast. And have you drawn these parallels yourself? Mm -hmm. Well, already uh, Marshall McLuhan had uh, thought about it, and, and Baudrillard also has, has raised uh, McLuhan, the idea that in communication, nothing is being communicated except communication itself, right? So uh, I wanted to go back to, for that to the idea of a, of a mobilization that uh, Junger introduced. Uh, Junger wasn't talking at the time in a, in a book called The Worker, which was published in the mid-30s. He wasn't talking about people being enlist, enlisted in the army or going on the battlefield, but the fact that the mobilization uh, is some sort of permanent state, right? In other words, what is happening is that wherever we are, we are being mobilized. What you call the semiotics is just that, right? In other words, the mobilization by signs, the bombardment of sign, uh, and it is not the contents or the nature of the images that at stake, or I would say in the same in the realm of art, it's not so much the nature of uh, the art that is being produced by the, the instantaneity of the transmission, the simultaneity of the happening, and uh, the accumulation of things that disappear as soon as they appear. And I think that's what he meant when he, when he was talking about the intercontemporarity inter of art. It's not that art uh, is not contemporaneous, but art is becoming suggest subjected to this kind of immediacy of things, so that uh, even photography itself is a certain way of uh, immediating uh, reality. You know, it's a, it's a way of speeding up the relation to reality. So what he's saying is that uh, we are now in a world where things happen before, before they happen. In other words, the, uh, the, the, the flow of signs is a flow that it is totally unoriginated and it uh, creates effect just by the fact that it exists, right? So that the fact that we are constantly in touch with the technology means that we are being made ready for a war that doesn't have to happen because we are the seat of the war, right? It's no wonder that, uh, that the internet was invented by ARPANET and the purpose of the internet was uh, to uh, provide an alternative in case of a, in case of a nuclear uh, uh, catastrophe. But what happens now is that we are being disembodied, you know, we are being immobilized by the very speed of communication and the very, uh, the very exchangeability of everything that is being communicated. That's what Junger uh, uh, anticipated, right? In other words, the very, uh, the very fact that we are using this technology, uh, the consequence of it is that we are used by it by such uh, degree that we are uh, going full speed the way we plug our hand in a, in a wall we are going full speed by staying still. And we don't need to move anymore. We are mobilized. 
And this mobilization is something that affects now, of course, all industrial countries. I'm, I'm saying that it is the same in every country and that everything is tributary to the same effect. But basically, what has been leaked, been leaked in our culture uh, is not just something that allows us to, uh, to, uh, to communicate more freely, but the fact that we are more and more prisoners of communication and that everything we do, even uh, that we find entertaining, is another form of mobilization, in other words, another form of disappearance. Uh, as you well know, when you use uh, the internet, you have no idea where things are coming from. You don't know what, is, what space it is emitted from. You don't know what the people look like. We are totally deterritorialized de through the deterritorialization of science. And that's what uh, the war is about. The war is about the more technological we become, the more abstracted we, bec we become. And we are uh, anticipating a form of uh, humanity that uh, become very estranged to anything we used to call human before. And that's what the problem is. Mm. Yeah. I mean, when you think of the fact that people are now becoming multitasking, texting from under the table in dinners with, a, with, a, with a iPods and, and, and cell phone, we are in constant communication. It is, it is a, the, a dream of a Foucauldian idea of, a, of a, a total enclosure. We are not free anymore not to communicate. And I think what, uh, uh, what uh, Virilio said about uh, about uh, some sort of ethics of uh, less is that we, we are now working constantly and working at our own disappearance. A bit like uh, in uh, Catskill, there is a cave, a huge cave, where all the accounting of uh, the banks are being stored in case of a nuclear, nuclear catastrophe. And it's, it's, it's a quite an image that I'm thinking of because uh, uh, it may be one day that we are, we will all be disappearing and what will be left behind are these strange figures that no one will be able to decipher. So my question um, has to do with uh, McLuhan and I'm interested to know if at any point in your conversations with, uh, with Virilio as well as uh, the other French theorists, was there ever any discussion, did they think about McLuhan, um, you know, interested in his ideas? Sorry? About uh, Marshall McLuhan? Uh, no, it doesn't refer to it ever, ever. It's, uh, it's Baudrillard who read it. Baudrillard is the only one who read very carefully uh, Marshall McLuhan in the 60s. Uh, no one else has done that. But of course, uh, he could have. He could have. It's not, uh, you know, that there is a huge overlap between, uh, and, and difference, of course, between uh, Baudrillard and Virilio. But what, what, what is common between the two and common with McLuhan is that it is not the contents of the, of the message, but the very fact of communicating which is at stake, right? Uh, it is uh, the, the, the instant transmission and at the same time the accumulation of, uh, of, uh, of images which make them unavailable and make us tributary to it, right? That, that's what the problem is. So no, McLuhan, we, McLuhan was a, an extrapolationist and he hasn't really been recognized as, as, as for, for what he did uh, on the American continent uh, because it, basically he was the American Baudrillard or he was the American uh, Virilio, except for, of course, the idea that uh, the world will become this great village. Uh, the great village has turned into a, a jail, you know, a, a golden jail. Uh, as uh, as uh, Virilio uh, keeps saying, globalization, and he said it very early on when everyone was talking about how great it is to be in touch and the whole world was communicating, etc. He said, this is a horror. Soon we won't be able to move anymore. We can go everywhere, but it's not be even being worth going, right?
is what you could what you could say about the um, possibility of resistance in the face of what we've just seen? Well, I find I find the uh, Virilio's uh, mode of resistance somewhat, you know, necessary, but not not. I, I don't think it is a, a form of resistance. It is a reappropriation of technology, right? But it doesn't mean that anything is going to happen to technology if it's conscious of itself, right? Um, uh, in the case of Baudrillard, yeah, resistance would be to just uh, uh, let let the system you know, go all the way, and that would be a common uh, common between the two. Let go all the way so that the reversal would happen. In other words, uh, as we nearly saw with the uh, uh, financial crisis, if you let capitalism go according to its own rule, then it is likely to self-destroy. Right. Uh, what Virilio didn't quite anticipate is the fact that uh, a, system, a capitalist system like uh, or a, a capitalist country like America c could go so far out of its way and nationalize and turn towards uh, some, some socialist measures, however temporarily. In other words, cap uh, capitalism goes to any possible length in order to preserve itself, even to the, to the point of... of uh, of negating its own principles, but as we saw was as well, uh, the better to fall back and to resume as if nothing had happened. And uh, what happens, you know, with, uh, I'll, I'll tell you after that, but my mode of resistance, but uh, what is strange at this point is that we live uh, in a world where catastrophe doesn't mean apocalypse anymore. We all know that uh, there are catastrophes coming. Now, we all know that uh, you're by year, I think it's 2012, if we haven't done anything about uh, the ozone and anything to reverse the trend, the trend of the destruction of the, of the atmosphere, we, it, it's going to be irreversible. And we accept that. Uh, we, see, uh, we see signs of it everywhere. The weather is changing, uh, palm trees in, the northern, in northern Italy. Uh, uh, we see signs everywhere, but we accept it because we don't have a choice, but also we forget it. Same way, and we begin to forget that uh, this uh, um, crisis that just occurred uh, ever existed, because now everyone is bouncing back, uh, everyone is uh, speculating again, semiotics, you know. Uh, now we have reached a stage of capitalism where money doesn't mean anything, right? We have billions of dollars have been moved around, but we accept the, possible, the, the fact because it they are so much beyond any sort of reality that they circulate between themselves, right? So the mode of resistance, of course, that's, that I wouldn't look towards uh, Virilio only in that respect. To understand the technology is a very important thing, and he was very ex instrumental and the very only one to say, to demonstrate and to say that uh, technology is something that's to be uh, 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 re um, Reigned, and that uh, technology could uh, produce the worst at the same time it produced uh, the best. I mean, we all dependent on technology for medical reason, but at the same time, the same technology is used to destroy the world. Right? So, is uh, is knowledge sufficient? Is a critique of technology sufficient? It is a form of resistance. Right? Uh, the other form of resistance, of course, uh, we all invented ours. You know, we invented in, in some ways. We find, we create uh, cracks where some form of, uh, of resistance to the, to, to the, the overall system is being, uh, is being uh, experimented with. Uh, in my very, very small, tiny way, I've tried to experiment with semiotext with the fact that there, there is, I, I was aware that we're entering a, a world where uh, everything is uh, becoming very difficult to uh, figure out and to fathom, and that uh, I was not trying to bring out uh, theories that uh, would become fashionable and, and create, uh, you know, like surplus to careers and uh, a lingua franca that could be used for other reasons than it is. I think we are in a very uh, drastic uh, situation, and the world needs to have more philosophers and however different their, their strategies and their solution can, can, they can provide, it becomes very urgent now to figure things out before we are being figured by it. 
Now, of course, uh, if, you, if you remember Foucault's you know, history of sexuality, there is one sentence in the whole book about possibilities of resistance. Uh, I would say uh, there is a possibility that, that are being tried out. I think the, 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 finance crisis, the financial crisis has at least produced this kind of consciousness that uh, we're not totally indebted to capitalists for everything, that it is a very dangerous machine that we are part of and contributing to, that maybe the other machine that could be, uh, uh, um, that, that could be invented in order to offset for you know, the, the kind of uh, massive injustice and, and, uh, and as Jack Smith would say, uh, 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 the term, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the useless destruction that is involved in capitalism, the, 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 I don't find the word. <laughs> so uh, what I'm saying is that the only thing that we can see at this point is that uh, there is a, an increasing uh, sense that something is to be found, uh, is to be, uh, found that, uh, that the system itself doesn't have to be blindly obeyed and that people have to somehow, you know, not just accept, you know, the, the, the flow of information as uh, being politically informed, right? So uh, all, these, all these are, you know, the various, various uh, signs are there that we are not only on the verge of a new era which is still uncharted, but this new era may uh, offer the possibility of inventing a uh, new form of, po of politics uh, that would be neither those we, we, we had before but that, and that couldn't counter directly the one we live in but would use it differently. And I think that's what's been tried. The, the fact that uh, we published uh, the, uh, a number of uh, Italian thinkers going in that direction, although I do have uh, my own problem with them. I think that uh, when they believe that technical uh, that, uh, that the general intelligence is going to, you know, as uh, you would say, uh, as, as a, the, kind of, the kind of intelligence that uh, Virilio is trying to disseminate, that general intelligence is enough to, uh, to uh, counter the, the, the movement of, the, of, of capitalism. Uh, it's, it is a possibility, but it is also clear that the transformation of work, the fact that work has become immaterial, at the same time means that we are all immaterial workers of a system that doesn't allow much leeway and it is even more difficult to break. Right? Uh, what I'm saying at this point is that capitalism produces not only a certain effect but it produces a certain ambivalence. We're all caught in an ambivalence and what I've been trying to do is make this ambivalence visible. You know, if you if you have, we we have at this point uh, an array of theories which overlap each other but also contradict each other. And I don't think theory itself is going to give us the answer. The problem is whether there is still uh, human agency and subjectivity and collective uh, effort can change anything. Uh, sometime when you look, for instance, uh, when you, for instance, uh, uh, at the new development with uh, with the stock market, you wondered if you know, anything can be done. The, the, the same mistake is being repeated like a year, or a year, year and a half after. The new means of, uh, of uh, provoking a crisis are on the way, even more cynical than they were before. Before, we are just trying to take people's uh, houses away or to in, induce, uh, you know, some sort of daylight robbery by making them believe that they could afford it. Now we, we have, in a way, as you know, uh, a, a new, a new uh, device uh, which is to uh, to just uh, explode people's life directly by uh, using retirement as a, as a as a new form of uh, speculation, right? So uh, what uh, what uh, what really teaches us is the fact that uh, we can trust the system to go right. You know, in the same way, he's not interested in capitalism. He never talks about it. But I would say uh, the capitalist system is cynical. A capitalist system doesn't respect anything, especially not humanity. And the connection between capitalism and technology is the deadly one. And uh, we're not uh, finished with it. And hopefully, uh, uh, it is not going to finish us before we can do something about it. But I have no more recipes. 
to provide than anyone else. You know, everyone is trying to, uh, I hope, working from where they are. We've been trying to use theories uh, as a way to uh, make people aware that uh, the situation is very complex, that uh, ideologies that don't have to oppose each other, that uh, contradictions can be adhered to at the same time, and the essential is to really uh, look at the complexity of the world that we are now uh, exposed to and try to figure out you know, what we can do about it. I, I have a question. Um, you were talking about um, how, to, how to move forward and figure things out. And in, in the film, Virilio was talking about the humility of science, mm -hmm. um, but also the attributes of um, immediacy and ubiquity being attributes of the divine. Mm -hmm. So do you think for science to have a humility and a humanity, do you think it would take an accident on the scale of something like a genetic crash to make science give up these, these uh, qualities or this aspiration to divinity? And, and what do you think a humble science would look like? Yeah, for, for very years, the crash is already here. The same way mobilization didn't mean that uh, war was going to happen, same way the possibility of creating, a, of tinkering with, a, with, a, with a, the genes, the human genes, is here. We know that it is just a matter of time for the, this, uh, this uh, manipulation of the human species to occur, right? Uh, as uh, William Burroughs said, there is no example of an invention that was never applied, right? We try to regulate it, but uh, same way we try to regulate nuclear weapons. Uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons have been, you know, it is envisaged uh, that they're going to be reused tactically. The same way science and the, 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 mad, the mad science of the concentration camps is already available. You know, it is going to use. The, the accident is already here. You know, and... Uh, Science will do exactly like everything else, and science hasn't proven uh, lately that it is in control of, 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 of itself, since it is mostly sold to big pharmaceutical companies, etc. It's a big business now, science. How could you trust science? Now, in fact, uh, uh, and I was talking to Virilio about it at one point, we, we are trying to envisage what the world would be in a, in a few decades, and all we could think of is a, a on one hand, the drug trust, so the, the drug, drug uh, the, the mafias uh, owning half of the world and the other half owned by pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies. It doesn't seem very, you know, the two being, of course, connected to each other. Uh, it's not exactly an owning entire continent. It's not impossible. Uh, science uh, by itself can be trusted. What I'm saying is that everything, everything, everything can be turned into a business. And unfortunately, we see more and more of scientists who, uh, who are under the pressure of competition, invention, etc., are ready to sell their soul. Um, maybe I have some binary glasses on, like you were describing earlier, these glasses. But talking about technology and Compute, knowing the computers run off of uh, ones and zeros, talking about Hannah Arendt's double-sided coin, the model of catastrophe and progress. Um, is there anything else, really? Because I, I feel that I, I'm seeing everything uh, now uh, on this idea of... of no, I, I, you saw one side that, that uh, Virio emphasized, emphasizes. Uh, you know, you have to, you can't deny that... Uh, he provided something because he was on a one-track mind trip, right? It's because he concentrated on what, every, what no one wanted to see, that he could provide a vision of what could happen. I don't think, uh, I don't believe myself that it has to happen that way. Actually, right after the, right after the, the, the financial crisis occurred, I just called him up and recorded somewhere what we said. But he was both excited, excited by the fact that finally the integral accident was happening, of course. Yeah. Uh, God, God may be there to protect him uh, in the end, but uh, 
there is something about technology, of course, to, 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 to bring out so much about technology, uh, you need to be uh, totally passionate by technology, and he says it himself. Uh, so uh, to think that his relation to technology is entirely negative, as it was a mistake. I think uh, he, he really is a passionate about technology because he's capable of synthesizing uh, the effect of technology that like no one else can, and he's very aware of it. And the fact that he could only do it by eliminating all the ambiguities and the ambivalence, that's the cost of it, right? You can't be fair in a world where fairness is not respected. Right? But you can be balanced in a world where even knowledge is unbalanced. And I think what he did uh, brilliantly is to uh, emphasize all the, possible, the possibility for disaster. And hopefully it doesn't mean that disaster is going to happen. In the conversation we had, uh, he, he, he was convinced that uh, that was it. It was like uh, 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 an event had happened. Uh, yeah, here it is. I'm going to quote, that's better. That was a conversation we had on January 2nd. He said, I don't, I'm translating from the French. Uh, it's only a beginning because I don't see how long, uh, I, I don't think we, we will see before, for, uh, for before a long time how we can come out of an accident like this one, which is without reference, which is linked not only to the economical and financial system, but to the numerical system, uh, to a system of interconnection, interconnection of, of banks. He said, this is, uh, this is a systemic, systemic accident, which is not only linked to the bank, but it is linked to the system, to the informatic system itself. Uh, um, big, uh, waiting for the internet system itself to explode. Right? Uh, so, what I'm saying is that he was right when he said that. He was right at the time. It was a systemic. Uh, it was not a, just a financial crisis like any other. The the, the crisis was feeding upon itself. The crisis was. Uh, it, it was impossible to to uh, solve it without infusing a huge amount of liquid into the system. And he didn't believe uh, it would be done. What happened is that it was done. So uh, an accident may be integral and could still, you know, by means that we may not approve of, uh, could still do something about it so that it, it is being avoided, right? Uh, my friend Christian believed that, uh, even before that, believed that we're going to get very close to, uh, to, the, to the total uh, collapse of the financial system. It won't be this time, but it probably would be another time. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, we don't know, for instance, in relation to the ecology. Uh, uh, Verilio was talking about the gray ecology, as he called it. The gray ecology because it's uh, the, 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 the disappearance of distance, the dis disappearance of space. We lack in space. That's what you call ecology. It's not just that uh, that uh, temperature is going to change or the climate is going to change, but we don't have space to breathe anymore, right? So that's what he called the disappearance of distance. But uh, um, okay. where was I? <laughs> hmm? Gray ecology. Yeah. No, we're, to we're talking about the financial system. How how can we how can we offset uh, the, the, this kind of ineluctability that uh, Vilio presents to herself? I think another reason why there is no way out uh, in terms of Vilio, except to have the knowledge of technology, is that he considers that the world is unified, and he doesn't talk from the point of view of those who don't belong to this world. Uh, if I, I'm just coming back from Brazil, uh, uh, you know, the other, other country like that, it seems we are very far from being unified and very far to share, you know, and to, and to be absorbed by that technology. The technology itself pretty much defined what uh, Slotedic would call la gâterie, you know, the sweet, the, those who, who have a sweet destiny, which is ours. Our sweet destiny is to disappear through technology. Uh, other countries in the world and other parts of the world disappear through other means. And we don't exactly know 
uh, when uh, when these you know they are tec techno techno they are tec tectonic plates yeah? are these plates being unified or are these plates going to clash and some sort of earthquake happen in between that may allow for something else to come out we don't know this is an accident also that that could happen because the world is not as unified yet as value the uh, anticipates simply because he anticipates a model that we are experiencing but nothing proves uh, we have the whole continent of Africa who is in total disarray. We have uh, countries over, all over the world where people are just, uh, uh, for whom work is slavery and not just uh, uh, a, sweet, a sweet disappearance. Uh, in other words, if we don't include from the beginning the possibility of heterogeneous, uh, uh, <coughs> or of heterogeneity be, uh, besides, uh, the effect of technology and the instrumentation of technology, then we are, we, ha we are in a theory that itself is a process of confinement. And that's what I would say. Uh, the, the theory of Virilio is a theory that opens our eyes, but like any theory, it has glasses of its own and these glasses prevent us from seeing what happens somewhere and that you could only see if you had other glasses. And that's exactly uh, the way I, I would take uh, Virilio. I think he, 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 he did a glorious work bringing out everything uh, dangerous that could come out of our, of our culture and civilization. But nothing says that this is going to be the case to that degree. The same way no one, nothing proved that uh, we could evade uh, 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 a crisis, a financial crisis to that extent, of that magnitude. He didn't believe it, right? And still, we managed to, to go over it. Same way, and that's what I wanted to do, to, to say. The same way, the, the uh, ecological disasters, as you know, is now bring, bringing up a new possibility for capitalism to spring back, because now, after having destroyed the planet for 50 years, we're going to take 20 or 30 years to clean it out. And that will be also what capitalism is going to do. So we don't know how things can reverse themselves. And I would say, Virilio, and that may be why I, I don't entirely, I, I take entirely what he does, but just as one of the facets, the same way in Nietzsche, uh, you have to give every person, every, uh, every, every character, the chance to express their point of view to the fullest in the richest way. And that's what I ex expect from Virilio and, and I respect in relation to him. But as uh, Nietzsche said, you know, on Nietzsche, the perspectivist point of view of Nietzsche is that he, he doesn't like the priest, but when the priest talks, he talks like the priest. In other words, he tries to give a chance to the priest to, to, to show how, how much creativity and invention it is to be able to invent a culture based on, on guilt, right? But he doesn't denounce it. He let everyone speak in their own voice. And I think what is so great with Virilio and tonight is that we can let him speak in his own voice and show how uh, much violence uh, and, uh, and uh, commitment he has to it. Uh, but I, again, same way, I, I, I don't really believe in the God uh, and I'm troubled when he said that technology is equal to God because that's what it means. If instantaneity, ubiquity uh, and simultaneity are the attributes of God, then technology is God. And he's like Arto, uh, at the, uh, trying to either uh, subject God to a judgment or expect God to intervene. This is his problem. Right? This is not my problem. And uh, I leave it to him. But he doesn't deter at all from his theory. You see? I believe that uh, every, every theory is not totally uh, connected, it's totally independent of what people are. Uh, I don't believe we are like machines, and I think that uh, philosophers create something the way oysters create uh, something, you know, uh, a pearl of culture. I think there is some pain there. Uh, it, it may be pain, it may be something else, but I accept the fact that whatever is created becomes not independent of them, but you know, it becomes some offering to the world. And we have to take it for what it is, but not believe that it is the only kind of offering. And we need to have you know, someone else who look at the world in a different way. And you know, 
we don't know at, at this point what is going to happen. No one knows exactly which way is going to turn. But if the priests want to talk, let's give the priests you know, as much possibility to, to, to show the creativity and the richness of his point of view and how far it covers the kind of horizon that, we, that is only beginning to emerge. Thank you.